Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 89, No Intelligent Conversation. We're going to continue our follow-up on the Shannon Street incident. Now, I know in some cases you're hearing some of this material and you're thinking, JR, we've already heard this before. Well, you have because we went through the case file, but you have to remember this after-action memos that we're going through is what each of the bureaus or teams are claiming that they did. So there is some value in it in that you'd love to read what they're writing in these official memos and see if that's what they actually did based on other material in the case file. Because what we read earlier is what they were doing at the time in the heat of the moment. So now we're going to see if they were actually doing that when it really counted. Now, let's, uh, I guess we'll go on and jump into that, see what's going on. To Director John Holt from Captain D.O. Lewis. Date January 18, 1983, subject hostage situation, 2239 Shannon. At 10 p.m. January 11, 1983, the hostage negotiation team set up a command post in a police van at the corner of Hollywood and Heard. Attempts were made to contact the occupants of the house at 2239 Shannon by telephone. However, negotiators repeatedly received busy signals. Contact had been made with the occupants of the house by the police dispatcher via police radio. The occupants were in control of the police radio belonging to Patrolman Hester, who had been taken hostage. During the conversation with the police dispatcher, the only demand made by the occupants was that he wanted to talk to a Mr. C.J. Morgan of WLOK radio station. During this period, the voice from the police radio was identified as Lindbergh Sanders, owner and occupant of the house at 2239 Shannon. It was also learned that Sanders was accompanied by several other male blacks when this incident began. After repeated attempts to contact Sanders by phone failed, the dispatcher was advised to discontinue his communication with Sanders that the negotiators were going to make contact by police radio. Walter Cruz of the hostage negotiation team made contact and talked to Sanders via police radio. Sanders repeated his demand to talk with Morgan of WLOK. Sanders was also cursing and ranting about religion. Sanders said he was holding a pistol to the patrolman's head and would kill him if we tried anything. The first sound from Patrolman Hester was when he shouted his call number 128. He was also heard to call for help. Information was received from uniformed officers responding to the scene that Sanders wanted to talk to Morgan of WLOK on the radio in an open mic situation. His purpose was to kill Patrolman Hester on the radio so everyone could hear the shot. He also made this statement to Cruz during his conversation. Negotiators moved into Shannon's school while still attempting to negotiate with Sanders. All contacts were very brief with no intelligent conversation. Sanders continuously raved and cursed about religion and threatened the police officer. During the early morning hours, A brother and a close friend of Sanders were able to get a brief response from him. During the conversation, Sanders would refer to Patrolman Hester as the devil, and Hester was heard to ask for help. Sanders would respond with, Do you hear the devil? It's going to be page two. As negotiation attempts continued, only short contacts were made with Sanders, at which time he would ramble about religion and curse, not making any sense. At 6 a.m., after not making contact with Sanders for approximately 
45 minutes, negotiators moved to the house next to Sanders and attempted to contact him by bullhorn. Possible responses were coming from the house. However, negotiators were unable to understand these responses. At approximately 7 a.m., Patrolman Hester was heard to yell, do what they want. Negotiators continued attempts to converse with Sanders throughout the day. However, no permanent contact was made. Some monitoring of the conversations coming from the house were picked up from the telephone receiver, which was off the hook, and also from a mic boom borrowed from news media. Only partial conversation was picked up, and some of this was directed towards Patrolman Hester, which gave hope that he was still alive. An additional mic was placed in a broken window, and more conversation was heard. The negotiators were still attempting to get a response from Sanders. At approximately 12.45 a.m., Sanders was heard to say, My brother is dead, the devil is dead, and the man you're trying to save is lying here with no air in him. Negotiators attempted to get Sanders to respond to them by use of the bullhorn. However, he refused to respond. Attempts continued until 3 a.m. when the tactical officers entered the house. Actually, Sanders was responding. He was just inside the house responding. Uh, what we're looking at here is a firearms use report, Memphis Police Department. Basically the same form they were using when I was on the job. Now there's one for each officer that was involved in any kind of a shooting, anybody that discharged a firearm. Now I I'm not even going to sit here and pretend to tell you that every officer that fired shots at Shannon Street volunteered that he fired shots or she fired shots and or that they actually filled out this form. But let's just say they were filled out by patrol officers and the members of the TAC unit that went inside. I don't know if we're going to do all of these, but I do want to do a few of them just so you'll see what the form looks like and what the officers put in the form. And remember, all this information is being reviewed by the Shelby County Attorney General's office, which has the power to take any of this information to the grand jury. And also the FBI will be looking at it, so now you've got the federal government looking at it. Okay, now this one is filled out by James Norton, and he's a reserve patrolman. You see up the top going across North Precinct, his IBM number, his age, years of service, duty status at the time is marked on duty, type of incident, officer calling for help. And, uh... Then you got that next block, wanting to know how the officer became involved. And it was an officer calling for help. Lighting conditions, night. Weather conditions, clear. Location of incident, 2239 Shannon. Weapon description, Smith & Wesson. And then it's marked MPD number 174. So all, all of our weapons were always stamped with an MPD number. You had a serial number, but you had the MPD number. Incident occurred. It's marked outdoors, type of premises, frame, single, family dwelling. Number of opponents, unknown. What weapon did they use? Unknown. Number of shots fired at you? Unknown, at least one. Distance from suspect when first shot was fired, 6 to 10 feet. Distance from suspect when last shot fired, 6 to 10 feet. 
Now, see, I thought that Norton was actually further away than he was. I thought he'd actually fire from the sidewalk. Six to ten feet would put him up, well, about even with the big oak tree or maybe a foot or so inside of that towards the front door because that's where Sanders was standing, was at the front door. Officer position, standing. Did you have weapon drawn and ready for use before you needed it? Answer, no. Are you, and it's asking right-handed or left-handed, Norton's marked right-handed. Did you have to reload? No. Did you count your shots as you fired? No, which is not uncommon. Did your weapon work properly? Yes. And it's a Model 10 Smith & Wesson. You, you just about can't make that gun not fire. It's so reliable. Did you have time to sight and aim? No. Number of shots fired? Four. Double action. Injuries suspect was... Now, he's got not wounded, and then he's got marked, uh, it looks like unknown, which, of course, autopsy later showed that, that that was probably Norton's shot that hit Sanders in the left arm, but, I mean, Norton wouldn't have known that. And it says, describe protective cover which you used. And then Norton's got no cover till shots were fired. Why did you use your weapon? Protect self. As you see, there's a different category. Protect self, protect citizen, perfect, prevent felony, prevent escape or flight. Now, you can see from this form here, this is pre-Garner. The Garner decision hadn't come out yet. After that, that little check block will be gone because it would have to say then prevent escape of a violent fleeing felon suspect wanted for other specify you gotta remember this is back in the days when the police could shoot you for committing any kind of a felony and then at the back I'm sorry at the very bottom it says background what did bullet strike if you missed? Norton put a no. Now, that's one of the questions I believe I told you all before and we'd ask in security squad. That is, what is your background? Police officers have to know what their background is when they're firing shots. If your background's a bunch of school kids out at recess, then that may affect your ability to shoot. So it's very important what your background was and what you think it was. And this, all this information, this statistical data is collected every year so the police department can keep up with, with the number of shootings, distance, and then, of course, all this information eventually is relayed up to the feds because generally the FBI will put out statistical data about police shootings. So it's really good information to have. All right. Now, this is the second part of this shooting form. This was entitled Supervisor's Shooting Incident Report. And this is filled out in conjunction with the, what the officer filled out on his form. Now, this one here is was reviewed by R.B. Summers. If you remember, Lieutenant Summers was the lieutenant that shot one of the suspects through the kitchen window. He's also the one that had a bunch of extra ammo in his pockets that he gave out to the officers when they ran short of ammo. So I always thought Lieutenant Summers would have been a good lieutenant to have worked for. You see his rank lieutenant, his assignment, North Charlie, and then you've got name of the officer using the firearm, and that's Norton. And then rank, reserve, duty status on duty, suspect's name, Lindbergh Sanders, 
male black. And the first one is where the lighting conditions such that would permit safe use of a firearm. Lieutenant Summers has got marked yes. Second one was the background presented to the officer as described, and did the background make safe discharge of a firearm possible? And Lieutenant Summers has it marked yes. Next question, is the reason given by the officer for discharge of the firearm in compliance with state law? If yes, justify answer. If no, explain answer. And Lieutenant Summers has got it marked yes. Now, I cannot for the world of me read what Lieutenant Summers wrote due to the age of the document. And, of course, I got a copy made. So, you know, a copy's never going to be all that good. He's got three lines filled out with some writing. Whatever he wrote there, it must have been okay because as long as those boxes that say yes are checked, then as the officer that's doing the shooting, you're in good shape. So whatever it says, Lieutenant Summers is saying Norton followed state law. And then next question, department policy, if yes, justify answer, if no, explain answer. Lieutenant Summers has got it marked yes. So in other words, uh, did the officer, when he discharged his firearm, did it comply with state law? Yes. Did it comply with departmental policy? Yes. Now, I can read this last answer. It says same as previous And then the last question is, first-line supervisor, are you satisfied that the officer exhausted all reasonable means prior to discharging his weapon? Answer, yes. All right, this firearms use report, this is Aikens filled this one out. Rank police officer, and it's got his IBM number, assignment North Precinct. Age 30 and length of service eight years. Duty status on duty at the time of the shooting. Type of incident, call for help, officer down. And it's described manner in which... uh, you became involved. He advised that officer was calling for help by the dispatcher. Lighting conditions night. Weather conditions clear. Location 2239 Shannon. Weapon description shotgun. Excuse me, shotgun. And then, of course, he's also got uh, Smith & Wesson. You know, with the shotgun, he's got Mark Double Op Buck. Uh, he didn't use any slugs, all double out, but incident occurred indoors, type of premises house, number of opponents, at least four. What weapon did they use? Pistol, number of shots fired, several. He's saying the distance when he was doing all his shooting was eight to ten feet. He's estimating that he fired 14 shots total. Officer position standing. Was the weapon drawn and ready for use when needed? Marked it yes. Aikens right-handed. And remarks or recommendations for weapons or training go to an automatic pistol, 15 rounds. Yeah, that's a good idea, Russ. Only problem is the MPD wouldn't go to a semi-automatic pistol until about 1993, something like that. Did you have to reload? Yes. How long did it take? I can't read what he's got written there. Did you count your shots? No. Did your weapon work properly? Yes. 
Do you have time to cite name? No. Number of shots fired. He's got a mark double action, no single action. And uh, suspect was not wounded, superficially wounded. Scribe protective cover, none at first, then use doorway. What did you use? Why did you use your weapon? Protect self, other, specify, assist down officer. And then background, wall unknown. All right, supervisor shooting incident report. Lieutenant Summers filled this one out as well. And he's got marked duty status on duty for Russ Aiken. First question was light conditions permit safe use of firearm, yes. Was the background presented to the officers described? Did the background make safe discharge of a firearm possible? Yes. And by the way, police officers do get charged for having a bad background. If you don't think that happens, <laughs> it does. Is the reason given by the officer for discharging the firearm compliance of state law? He's got it marked yes. And let's see if I can read this. Officer had gotten called for help, and at least one officer had been shot. I, I think it's basically what that says. So, according to Lieutenant Summers, Russ Aiken followed state law, then departmental policy. Answer is yes. Officer had called for help, and at least one officer had been shot. So that is the answer Lieutenant Summers is using. That's probably what he had for the one for Norton as well. I don't think there's any doubt Norton and Aiken both are justified in firing. As first-line supervisor, you satisfied the officer exhausted all reasonable means prior to discharging his weapon. Answer yes. Additional comments? Uh, officer jumped by several male blacks and two were sent to hospital. I can't read the rest of it. Lieutenant Summers is going to make sure that there's enough on this document to justify what Russ Aiken did. And believe me, Russ Aiken is well justified. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode here. We'll come back here in a few days, and we'll probably do a couple more of these. I, I want to do at least a couple of the TAC officers. I don't know if I'm going to do them all. If anybody out there wants me to do them all, I mean, I'll do it if you want me to. Um, I don't mind. It's just to figure y'all might get bored with repetition. Uh, I can tell you that Every officer on that scene was, their shooting was real justified by the department. And Shelby County Attorney General's office didn't prosecute anybody, neither did the FBI, so I'm gonna take it that that uh, all the shootings were justified, but I do wanna do a few more of them. I just don't wanna bore you, but at the same time now, this information is for you to review now and forever. Oh, if you want me to get them all in, I'll do it. All right, that last little red square there, that was 2012, Lieutenant over Vice Narcotics Unit. Man, that was a good team. I sure did enjoy being over there. Get to wear my Hawaiian shirts and my cowboy boots and my blue jeans. They did all the work and I just looked pretty. All right. That was a good team, though. Boy, they were sharp. All right, folks. That's it. I do appreciate y'all's patience with me. And we will get back together in a few days, and we're going to pop out some more stuff. I can tell you now, coming up, we're going to get some material back from the FBI, their crime lab in Washington, D.C. So we're playing with the big boys now. 
folks, thanks for being here with me. And as always, I'll see you down the road. <laughs>